We have uh, quite a number of, of questions and comments on, on this panel. Um, one from Ming Chen Liu. Thank you for putting together this great panel. I'm a native of Dongcheng District, Beijing, and grew up quite near to Zhihua Si. The temple was designated as a national level cultural relic site in 1961. Now it serves as a museum for Beijing's folk life and arts. In the temple, we can enjoy the traditional Buddhist music and ceremonial performance, which is a designated intangible cultural heritage dating back to Ming Dynasty. The temple is open to the public. Yes, it is um, interesting to note that this is a, a living um, treasure and it is something that people can still experience um, by going and visiting and, and not just in a historical way as we study it as art historians. Any comments from our presenters? Yeah, the, uh, you know, I, I just want to say this one where, you know, the uh, in conjunction with our uh, our project, we are hoping to build a website in the future that will feature uh, Zuhua Temple and also our the results of our research, including the 3D images, all that. So, uh, and yeah, in, indeed, the, the musical part is very, very important uh, The uh, in terms of the history of the, the temple. So definitely we will, uh, that part will be included. So, so the project itself is really uh, interdisciplinary. Our historians cannot do it alone. And then, so this, just like Professor Jai has said, it's a wonderful collaboration, uh, working with the museums and then the institutions in China or that, so. Any other comments? Yeah, I'll just aware of the importance of the uh, music. And I would have loved to, um, you know, and I have been thinking about or have thought about how to try and incorporate it within the whole presentation of the ceiling. Um, but um, at this point, what I have managed to do is the, uh, when we produced the interactive, we worked very closely with the Dropa Temple and I'm very grateful um, to um, director Xue Jian, um, former director Xue, Xue Jian, um, and um, uh, Yang Zhiguo, who um, sent over high resolution images of the temple, which you had seen um, as part of the interactive, um, and also a recording of um, their music um, played by their musicians. So we have integrated some of the music into the iPad as well. Um, and then we also shared the iPad with the Droha Temple as well. Yes, that interactive um, was very excellent. Um, I experienced it myself there, and it was very good to hear you talk about it here. Um, another question is, uh, from an anonymous attendee, C.T. Lu has come up several times through this symposium. How has the controversy around his dealership been tackled and explored so far? I think that's quite a big issue and it's not just C.T. Lu. Um, there are many dealers involved, um, international dealers from, from China, from uh, from Japan uh, and Europe and the US. These are all um, people who contributed to you know, the interest in Chinese and um, Asian art in the West, but at the same time to the um, damage and defacement of many cultural properties. And um, it is from their work as dealers uh, with the collectors and the museums that we have our museum collections today. So this is something, yes, we do have to face up to. And our other speakers dealt with this in, in great depth in some of the earlier talks. Any other comments on that? I think Noel, who uh, in uh, the first day presentation, one of the presentations mentioned about 
uh, last November, December, there was a, indeed there was a conference uh, dedicated specific to City Lou, I think hosted by uh, Free Gary. So, so there, there, there are some scholars out there working on this topic. Uh, and then, you know, still uh, there are more, more and more information came out, you know, in the past uh, number of years. But, but the, uh, uh, I can't, I, I'm not an expert on, on City Lou. My, uh, my knowledge about City is more about uh, his uh, initiation of the temple room. So, so I'm not sure I will be able to, to say too much beyond that. So, I know um, the the dealer Yamanaka Sarajiro is another um, one of the very big time dealers uh, at, who was a contemporary of C.T. Lu, and uh, he's responsible for handling a lot of the the Tianlongshan sculptures, and and his descendants um, are still um, around, and they have um, been looking up the history. Of, of, the, of the Yamanaka company and have published a large volume of materials that he handled. So um, yes. well, there is a great deal of interest in this. Yeah, the, the uh, bar tray is, uh, we have uh, this lots of discussion today. And um, as a curator, we, we also spend a lot of time to do the provenance research this is a really important work for us today. Um, I cannot speak for, uh, for the entire museum, but um, we'll do our best to try to find out the, um, the provenances and the, the history of how the artwork came to the museum. Yes, there's a great deal of interest now among our historians in the recent history of these objects. Uh, so yes, it's a, it's a good new field of study. Um, um, yes? The Philadelphia Museum didn't have uh, much dealings with C.T. Lu. I think um, within Philadelphia, he probably um, uh, had much more dealings with the Penn Museum um, uh, rather than the Philadelphia Art Museum. So. Uh, Within, within the Chinese collections, I think there's maybe one or two ob objects um, that, that, that we do have from um, him. So I thought it was interesting. He, he probably targeted or wanted to have dealings with, um, with, with certain museums at certain times. And because Philadelphia was concentrating at the time after Langdon Warner left, um, Langdon Warner was very early, he was director from 1917 to 1923. Um, uh, and he started collecting early materials then um, for the museum. But after he left, um, I think the museum tended to collect later works of art. So maybe that has something to do with um, mm -hmm. that relationship too as well. Mm. I think City Lu is only one of the uh, art dealer in the early 20th century, although he handled the last work. And he has special interest in the museums in Midwest. Um, it's not only Nelson Atkins, but he also went to St. Louis, Chicago, or the um, Detroit Museum of Art. Noel just put it in the Q&A. She said that Freya Sackler will be posting the recordings of the Lou and Yamanaka seminars that have occurred in the last year. So uh, we should probably wait, uh, looking forward to that. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Noel. All right, anonymous uh, question. Thank you for the rich content and sharing in this symposium. I can't help but wonder how these materials could play a role in bridging differences, grooming relations, and even mediation in our current situation in the states with growing numbers of um, violence and uh, racism targeting Asian Americans. This question diverges quite a lot from the symposium's nature, but I would love to hear what you think being American-based experts in East Asian art and cultures. Anyone want to take that on? Uh, the topic we have talked a lot at the museum, how the, uh, um, how the museum can help uh, to help for how the 
uh, racial tension since the last year. Um, and I think the uh, last year, the summer, the break line, break line matters movement um, has great help for how we have could handle the uh, Asian American um, violence today. And uh, as we have a, a very strong uh, Asian art collection, like uh, Philadelphia and also the, um, the major museum in the American, um, I looking forward to pray a lot for this topic. Well, the yes, the curatorial uh, people in museums have uh, they play a very important diplomatic role, I think, because they have um, reached out to um, the communities of, of Asian Americans, but also um, now of many tourists who come from Asia and um, in organizing their visiting exhibitions. Um, and uh, scholarly exchange programs. Uh, the museums and the scholars are very important in these activities. Um, a, a question from Catherine Novotny. Chen Chang, has anyone asked the Nelson Atkins if they would return the portions of the ceiling that they are not using so you can include them in the restoration of the Zhihua Su. No, I think this project is focused on digital reconstruction. Uh, and the real object is a, a complex problem in the uh, has relationship to the politics or another uh, things. Mm. And during the digital task or works, we uh, works in uh, Beijing Zhihua Temple and uh, Nelson Museum. Uh, there's no person asking me the same question or some related cause uh, they, they know that this is a difficult <coughs> problem or um, but from the uh, technical view of uh, reconstruction, uh, if we got the information uh, of the setting or of the painted panels, uh, it is, uh, is sufficient for uh, virtual space reconstruction of the whole environment. And uh, I think it, um, uh, from this project, I, I think there's no need to uh, put the uh, settings back. I think just the, the information is sufficient for this project. Yeah. Exactly. Um, what we're returning um, is the information about these pieces. And this is a very um, valuable uh, sharing of material uh, with the museums. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, just for the information, um, not all the uh, Tiangong Gelo located at the Nelson Atkins, some of them were lost. We only have uh, 17 pieces of that. And of course, yes, it is a yes, larger... There are scholars in China who are studying the, um, the meaning and the, and the iconography and the arrangement of the ceiling panels. So, they may be able to do uh, reconstruction with, with that kind of research. Actually, indeed, we have, we have done the uh, uh, 17, the number is actually enough. And also, the, uh, if you look at the, the uh, Tiangong logo, the arrangement, they're symmetrical. So, so it's, it's pretty easy. 17, the, the sex are pretty, the, the number is, is good enough so we can surmise uh, the missing parts. And then the uh, Chen Xiao knows about that. Uh, and we're working with the Tsinghua University. Uh, we, were, we were able to not only uh, scan the existing ones, but also made the 3D models for the missing, the missing ones. So the reconstruction have half uh, the completely three models and then the other half 
will be the uh, the the actual skin from from the 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 remaining seventeen in the uh, collect uh, Nelson's collection. So. Okay, thank you. I think we've uh, addressed this uh, question about repa repatriation. Now, a question from Fletcher Coleman. Um, uh, two professors, Jadrofe and Chen Jiang, fascinating restoration work, also on the Empress Procession Reliefs. Um, I'd welcome you to reach out if you have any questions about the historiography and conservation of the Empress procession from archival perspectives. Um, I have published a dissertation and several articles in the past few years dealing with this topic in the past. Uh, and in addition to my work on ink rubbings presented on Friday. So that's a very generous offer from Dr. Fletcher Coleman to share his research with our um, Inyang Caves project. Thank you, Fletcher. And Fletcher, I did share your article with Xi'an Jiao Tong Da Xie. Oh, thank you, thank you so much. Yeah, the the uh, Binyang Central Cave is our uh, in, an important uh, research these days, and uh, I I hope uh, experts and professors can share your research results with us and uh, uh, make this research more valuable. Thank you. Um, uh, so a technical question about what is the approach of digital reconstruction toward minor surface damage to wood artifacts? Is this uh, reproduced or filled? Yeah, I think uh, it's based on what kinds of missing parts or damage. Uh, for example, in the research of the Chukwa uh, temple ceiling, scanning, we find that there are some parts of the dragon head uh, is damaged. Um, but as we can see, there are eight or nine dragons on the ceiling. So uh, if we the shapes or information uh, is similar, we will uh, duplicate the similar parts to the missing portion because they are carved in the same time or by the same uh, artists, so the shape and is is most valuable for the missing parts. <laughs> yes, but for the uh, slightly damaged parts, such as mm, just uh, plain shapes or geometry damage, we just uh, uh, need to you use simple hole filling tools to figure these things. There's also a question about the Tianlongshan sculptures that um, Wei Zheng um, showed uh, to ask about how we know um, the proportions of, of the sculptures uh, and how they fit together. Well, it, uh, the scans, the 3D scanning technology um, measures pieces, uh, unlike photogrammetry, it, it measures the size. So then they can be matched quite well, according to um, where they belonged, but then there are also missing parts when something was cut from the cave wall. Um, there are broken areas that we have, we can't account for. So it's just a matter of also kind of, uh, um, it's not just guesswork. We have historic photographs of these objects um, that we can also rely on. Mm -hmm. um, another question. Is there any information about who at Zhihua Temple authorized the removal of the two ceilings? Um, yes, I think um, the uh, Hiromi and Lingen have both um, gone into that in part. But do you, but do you guys know the, the how much they pay for it? No, right? I don't remember the records about that. Mm. Yeah, I, that's that, that's something that may be in our registration records. Mm -hmm. I think there's uh, some details. Uh, we, we still need to investigate how the ceiling come down from the from the temple, and uh, I 
didn't find uh, much useful information from the museum archives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, I, uh, mm -hmm. go ahead. I assume the uh, the photograph from the uh, in Zhao in Zhao uh, Fa Shi in Zhao have been sent to many art theaters. Mm -hmm. yeah, and and I, um, I, I figured out how um, when Horace Jane purchased the ceiling was actually reading through correspondence when Fisk Kimball had written to Liu Dunchen um, saying that he had known that Horace Jane had purchased it when he was in Beijing. So there's no nothing directly related to, um, you know, there's no records to give us detailed information, unfortunately, about, you know, names of dealers or things like that. But my understanding is that, yeah, the, it, it, the atmosphere was such that you went to Beijing, there were dealers or, or runners around um, that were offering you works of art. And that's, that's probably how mm -hmm. Jane, Jane mm -hmm. purchased it. No, and the no. relationship between um, uh, Warner and Sigmund and, and Jane, I think, had some play, um, some part to play because I think Philadelphia purchased the ceiling first, um, and Sigmund then was purchased the um, ceiling for Nelson Atkins. But um, Philadelphia didn't have any money to be able to install it, so that's why it wasn't until the 1950s that we actually installed our ceiling. Yeah. Mm. So in both yeah. cases, it, um, the museums did not purchase the ceilings directly from the temple. Mm, no, um, yeah. uh, I think there is some data involved between. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, but I, I remember I read somewhere in the archive that the uh, uh, when Landon Warner told uh, Sigmund when Sigmund was in China, right, told him about the seating, and he went to the temple to see it with Eck. And then the, uh, uh, what he reported in the letter is that the temple then was used as a school, right? So mm -hmm. it's not, was not running as a temple, was actually being used as a school, which is not too unusual uh, for the circumstances then, right? So, so I'm not sure the, uh, who actually authorized the sale is that from uh, the temple abbots or, or whom I don't, that, that part that was not recorded. I think we can do one more um, to all panelists from Xi Zhang. It's so amazing to see how the digital technology has been applied to the museum context nowadays, which helps virtually reconstruct and fabricate a Buddhist architectural space and enables the audience to observe structural details and particularly diversifies the general access to museum objects. Uh, for example, 3D objects online. But meanwhile, I was wondering if we as general audience, audiences are able to view and experience the Buddhist caves and artifacts in such thorough ways through online projects without going to the museum. Do you think in future this would jeopardize the role of museums as site and intellectual institution to present and interpret the artworks in any way? I think um, that going to a museum is such a different experience. Um, seeing a work of art mm -hmm. in real life is really very different from being able to see the details. And I think that's why this 3D scanning project is, is great because it actually creates another audience um, to be able to study the details. Seeing something in, in real life is, is completely different. Um, if you actually stand in the gallery and see the, 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 the ceiling installed above you, um, it, it, it gives you a whole different impression. So I'm not so worried about that problem. Actually, since the last year, since the museum closed after the pandemic, uh, every museum encouraged uh, Visitor use their website, use their virtual material. Uh, but as a curator, I think I would like to uh, guide the audience that nothing can replace look at the, looking at the real objects, like Hinomi indicated before. Yes, I think a lot of people have been going to the museum websites because they have missed going to the museums. So. <laughs> And so I think that will always be a very important part 
of the museum's purpose was to bring people in close contact with real objects. Yeah, I, th I think, I, I don't know, I mean, because I'm not a museum person, so I don't work at a, in, a, in a museum setting at this moment. So uh, I probably don't, won't think from that perspective. I think, uh, why not? You know the uh, so if you if you go visit Dunhuang's website, there's a there's a what's I call digital Dunhuang, right? So a lot of caves, uh, you can use a, a cheap Google uh, Glass and then put put your 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 iPhone in there, and then you can actually see the three D. You can see the cave three D and experience that way, uh, and it make it available. I think it's great because the technology really make it democratic. Right, so anyone who can use a de device can can do it, and it becomes more accessible. So why not, right? So and I think for the museum, that is also a good way to reach out to broader audiences. So so why not do it? But with that, we praise museum. I'm not sure, but with that, change the course of the museum. That's possible, right? So because so much, so many things that audience can uh, or visitors can do right now with by using technology. So what about museums? So what, what can museum offer in order to work with the technology? Yeah, so that's some, something that I want, I try to sell to my friends who work in the museum, you know, is, uh, rather than thinking about that as a, a threat, but uh, try not to embrace it and then explore the way, uh, today we talk about digital humanity so much and the professor has proposed this, this a digital Chinese art history. So, so it's right there already. And then our history is actually quite behind um, compared with other fields, right? So, so I think a museum today, this, is, this will be a time, you know, pandemic and everyone trapped at home. So uh, the, the, the technology provides uh, a channel for, for, for people to, to get connected, right? So, so, I, so I think that's, that of course, you know, I, I won't want to see that becomes a reality where the museum being replaced. Right, so like I say, uh, the, digital, the digital devices are not supposed to replace the materiality of artifacts, but should help us, right? So in a way, so and then I think that's where we all need to explore. Uh, today, uh, I think it's, we are still in a very, very early, part, early stage of the research, how we can incorporate this digitality in our research. And then hopefully in the future, uh, we'll be able, able to catch up with some other disciplines. Thank you. I think this is uh, all the time we have for our discussion. Um, thank you for your questions and answers. Uh, we will move on now to our roundtable discussion, which is um, chaired by Professor Wu Hong, and will include um, some of the moderators from our other panels. 